Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Talking Leadership podcast series. Thank you for joining me once again. By way of introduction, my guest today is the founder and CEO of the Raising a Village Foundation. Can I welcome to the podcast, Jaleesa Hall? How are you, mate? I'm good, Eric. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you for joining me. I know it's the end of a long week for you, so I do appreciate you giving me some time to talk about your leadership pathway. So your leadership and its beginning. So where did it all start for you, mate? That's a good question. I am the youngest of seven, of seven children. I was born in Miami, Florida. And so you would think that as the youngest that I did, I was a little, I was a good little sister and I followed the pathways of my siblings. However, that is not the case. Uh, I believe that my leadership um, journey really started at the home, um, being the baby of the family and my the brother that is closest to me is nine years my senior. By that time, I was just always around older teenagers and adults. And so I was really in taught to be to be engaged as a person, right? Like I am not a baby, I am a full person, I'm an individual. And I got to say what I wanted to say in the household, um, from what I wanted to wear, um, what activities I wanted to be a part of. I had a voice and I think being able to, even though to be the youngest child, having the ability to have a voice and to have a say, and my say matters, um, I think was the start to me seeing that I was a leader. Outside of that, I was also very involved in my local church, um, particularly in the Black church context. It's very um, normal for a young person to be a part of plays or the choir or uh, leading a Bible study. Um, and, and it didn't help that my godfather was the bishop of my church. And so I had no choice but to also engage in that way. And that can, again, that just continued through different dance teams I was a part of, being dance captain. And then I had a really transformative experience in college that really launched me into really what I'm doing today with RAV. But I don't know if I, you want me to go into that or we'll hold off. But that's kind of a little the story. No, please, that, that would be great. Uh, if you could share that, that would be good. Where people come from a big family, that expectations of the eldest to the youngest sibling can vary quite wildly. You, you read a lot and you see a lot about three kids in a family versus what you said, seven, you being the youngest of seven. Obviously, from a young age, you, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Self-actualized very young and thought, yeah, no, yes. I've, I've got a place here and this is what I want to do. So yeah, please, please share what, what you wanted to talk about before that'd be great. You know, I, I I come from a family of leaders, right? From my siblings, they've all have leadership positions, of course, dealing with me as a child. My mother was a teacher for 35 years. I saw her lead children in the classroom. She had an advocacy organization as well um, to help single mothers who had children who were incarcerated with no real proper legal counsel. She would help them find the proper legal counsel for their children. And then my father was, he's passed away, but he took over my grandfather's construction business, but he would rebuild homes that were um, for free, that were really destroyed by hurricanes in Miami, Florida. And then, like I mentioned, my godfather was the bishop of my local church. So again, I was always around leadership. And even though I had, I self-actualized my own, you know, voice and leadership skills, I didn't know what that was going to look like. I wasn't looking to be the CEO or anything as a child. I wanted to be on television. I wanted to do what you're doing. I want to do podcasts and, and, you know, to be a video DJ, right? That was kind of what I thought I was going to do. But in college, um, I started a student organization through the to a kind of a campus club, a student organization on the, on the college campus, really as a way to do something different on weekends. As an 18 and 19 year old, I did the club thing. Most of us do. We're out and about. We're having a good time, right? But it got kind of boring because I started to see the same people, started to hear the same music, just got tired, Derek. And so I said, I want to just find a way to get people together to do some other things around the city. I went to a historically Black college and university in, um, in, in the United States called Clark Atlanta. So it was predominantly Black. And the friends that ended up joining the organization had a real heart for community. Every activity they wanted us to do was surrounding serving others. Part, it was a two, twofold reason why. One of the reasons was 
a part of our graduation requirement, we had to have community service hours, a certain amount of them. And so it was like, let us be the people that folks go to to get their community service hours. That's how we can gain membership, gain notoriety, et cetera. Made a lot of sense. But the other reason that was the case was because surrounding our college, the, the community was very blighted. It was very, it was dealing with, you know, still reeling for white flight, gentrification that happens in the United States to real urban centers. And there are people that were hurting around a beautiful college campus. And so my folks and me wanted to help. So at first, we would just send people out to food banks, to uh, medical clinics, to just kind of serve as volunteers. But as the organization grew from my second year of college to about my senior year, we started to create our own community initiatives. And one of them was an education program called the Driven to Succeed program at a children's shelter, where we would get folks to come every week to go to the shelter to do homework help and mentorship activities with children. The organization grew from six of my closest friends. By the time I graduated college, we had a 100 members strong. We had about five initiatives that were going around Atlanta, Georgia, including this shelter, right, program. I'm 21, 22, Eric, right? I'm still inter- I'm actually interning at CNN, uh, trying to transition to a full-time job. But a mentor said to me, Jalisa, do you know you're running the whole nonprofit? Like, do you see what's happening? Because it got to the point where I was able to intern and like do my thing and the organization was just running on its own. And I kind of stepped back and my mentor said something very powerful, Eric. He said, you don't want to break news. You want to make news. And that hit me like a ton of bricks, right? Because I was able to see that I wasn't just doing something for fun, but I was actually doing something on purpose. And it was making impact. And really from that experience at 22 years old, I decided to go to graduate school in Washington, D.C. I had to study nonprofit management, which I did, to, to work at some of the most notable government organizations and nonprofit organizations in the District of Columbia so that I can like really understand what this means in a real formalized and institutional way. And then I received a, a Shark Tank kind of event award where They gave me $10,000 to start RAV, to start raising a village. And then from there, it's been, it's been a wild ride ever since, but, but that's kind of my journey. And it started out as, as a 20 something year old. Yeah. It's interesting that you built something and you didn't see what you'd built until someone that was mentoring you said, Hey, let's take a step back and have a look at what you've done before you progress and think you haven't built something. And obviously your mindset at the time was you weren't building a system, a an organization, a um, an environment for the things that you wanted to see happen, happen because there were a, there was a group of you working on it, obviously. And I assume you had a leadership role there, a quite prominent one that, that prompted your mentor to say what he or she said to you that made you have your light bulb moment. And that that's always the um the benefit of having a, a mentor in your life at some point that will give you that that hint that something is happening without telling you what to do with it. Obviously, that it, it's funny you can. You can be in a relationship with someone like a mentor or a coach or a teacher and the person who's the mentee doesn't get it until you actually say it out loud because yeah. you've, you've, you've got a million things going around in your mind. Look, you've helped quite significantly lead into the next question and I can guess how you might define leadership because you've given some hints through that initial response, but I'm not going to guess because the podcast is about you. <laughs> so I'll ask you direct, what's your definition of leadership? My definition of leadership is having the ability to create mission and vision that can galvanize people to achieve a particular goal. That is what leadership is to me. There is a visionary component to leadership. The leaders, I believe, they also have this ability to create mission and purpose. It could be to build safe, healthy, and whole communities as that's the mission of raising a village. Or it can be the mission today is for us to be able to flip how many burgers to be able to get this many customers, whatever, no matter what it is, right? The, the, the leader has a vision of what they want to see and a clear mission that people can galvanize around um, to make something happen. So that is, that is how I, I envision leadership 
given the 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 social circles that you ran the community focus that you've got the religious context in which you were brought up and where you went to study do you think those things helped shift your definite definition of leadership and why i ask this is was there a morphing of your understanding of what it meant for you pre the organization you lead now and now that you are as a founder and CEO, what was there a marked difference for you as you stepped through that process or was your definition pretty much um, maintained through that process? That's such a good question, Eric. You know, my, my understanding of leadership has expanded and deepened, right? From leading a campus organization at 20 to 22 versus now me at 33, right? Uh, who is who has experienced a little bit of life. It's been about 11 years, still young, right? Still considered a millennial or whatever that means, but, but still 10 years is a long time. A lot can happen in 10 years. And I would say, yes, when I went to American University to do my master's in nonprofit management, it was really about the mechanicals of how to create an organization, right? What do you need? What are the components? You need nonprofit leadership, executive leadership. You need fundraising, you know, resource development. You need grant writing. You need all, you know, those kinds of components to make a nonprofit run. You need to know how to develop programs, how to implement them, how to evaluate. It's very mechanical. Again, things that I needed to know that if I started a nonprofit, what were the components? But what really deep in my understanding of leadership was actually when I went to seminary. I went to divinity school, theological, the, um, to, to do theology. I got a master of divinity at Wesley Theological Seminary um, in Washington, D.C. Wesley Theological Seminary also has a community engagement institute where I was a fellow that gave me the $10,000 to start RAV, right? At Wesley, as a community engagement fellow, it wasn't just about the mechanics of community work, but it was the why. So it's not just about doing good or making good in the world, but why do you wanna make good in the world, right? And that, so that's how the, a different holistic approach to the work. So we did things like asset mapping, right? So instead of saying, oh, this blighted community, oh, look at them. Oh, they have they're in they're in a they're in a food desert. They're experiencing food apartheid. Oh, look, they don't have clean water. Oh, poor people, right? Look, coming from that perspective, we're a nonprofit. We're going to plant our flag and help those people. That's not what I had. That's not that 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 kind of thinking had to be shifted. What seminary did was to say, what is the good that is already happening there? And it is not your job to plant your flag or impose your will on that community, but rather how can you unearth the treasures that are already there and journey alongside folks in continuing to do the good that is already there? Because if you focus on the good, right? Growth mindset versus deficit mindset, the deficits will take care of itself. But let's, because everybody's already pointing out the bad, right? Everybody's already pointing at it. So, but there's good there too. Let's focus on that. And so thinking about that in terms of my leadership, that is the very culture of raising a village. Like my staff talk about, we, when we go into a school, we go into a shelter, we go in there, not with, yeah, we have our thing. Yeah, we do our thing. We know what we do well, but we go in there in a collaborative process, right? These are the services we have to offer. What's happening here that we can, how can we partner together? How can we journey together? And so that has helped me, Think about leadership, not from I'm going to tell you what to do, but from a more collaborative process instead of a controlling process. It seems that there is no way known on earth that you weren't going to be shaped by the environment in which you worked in. And it, it's interesting that from a not-profit space or I, my day-to-day -day job is work, working for a not-for-profit member organization, but it's a business-focused organization in an industry setting, whereas you decided to work in that more difficult space of community and, and giving something back to your local communities, whatever they may look like. And I believe the approach that you took is quite an interesting one because you often hear that some not-for-profits in the space that you play in have a culture that they want to in bed with mm -hmm. with the people that they're helping and i think if you're going to build tr trust 
that's a that can be a quick way to erode it because the question from the people being helped is we might not necessarily have everything great but we do have something to offer and mm-hmm. uh, um, taking a collaborative approach suggests that you want to amplify what the good is and yes you've got to deal with the shit that comes with trying to help rebuild but you're trying to focus on the positives yeah that makes a lot of sense and it, it would and if we can talk again in another 10 years, I'm, I'm assuming your definition may not change too much, but a lot can happen in that time. You, you said, I'm, I'm only 33. You're exceptionally young. You've got a lot more career and a lot more to do. I'm pushing 50, so I can understand hey, that. The, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm close to 50. But I, I came to discover in my non-work life what it was to give back to my school community. Mm-hmm. And there are there are so many benefits to doing that, that those that don't engage in it don't understand that it can make you a better person and potentially a better leader when you, you're giving without an expectation of getting something back. Um, that's yeah. a good that's a good feeling. And, and to do that as a full-time gig, I can understand why that is attractive to many people. Um, and again, mm-hmm. your your response helped me to segue to my next couple of questions or, or topic areas. Yeah. I didn't um, develop the following phrase, but it's a good one to understand what your perspective is on leadership. That lonely road of leadership, is, it's often said that leadership is about making decisions and, and sometimes you're doing that in a bubble because you need to as a leader. But is it a lonely road or as lonely as you make it? That's so good. I think there are seasons of loneliness. Yes. I, depending on the life cycle and where you are in the organization. When raising a village was just an idea or a pit on paper, when it was just a business proposal. Yes, it was lonely because it was just me who was excited about this idea, who was shouting it from the rooftops, right? It was just me. I was it. I was raising a village. I, and I was saying, we... <laughs> I was in all these, you know, collaborative terms. We, it was just me. It was just me. If they really just pulled out the curtain, it was just me. And that, that was a particular loneliness there because I had to, I was by myself, you know, you know, trying to spread the news of what was coming and having to get people to journey alongside me and get excited. So that was a particular way, a particular time of loneliness. As we're in this place of exponential growth, Raising a Village, just, in, just to give you just kind of context, Eric, we were incorporated in 2019, 2017, which means that we just got our paperwork. We didn't launch our first program until 2019. We, had, we were in one school in 2019. By 2020, we were in three locations. Now we're about to enter 10. So it's been exponential growth in a matter of about two years, right? Two and a half years. The loneliness sees a little different now because as the organization has grown, it has pulled me away from the work a little bit to focus more on not the operational needs of the organization, but also where we're going strategically. So while everybody is now on board with the work that we do, now I'm trying to sell a vision of where we're going to be in the next five years. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm already ahead of where everybody else is. Even though I have a crew with me, everybody is excited. They're in the now. In my mind, it's five years from now, actually three years from now because of the rapid growth. So the loneliness in this sense is that I'm by myself thinking, incubating, always pulling us forward. And as a leader, I think you're always going to be a couple years or a couple months, however, whatever your context is ahead of your people, because that's your job, right? To pull people along, you know, for the ride. I will also say that as a, as a Black founder of a nonprofit organization in the, in the U.S. context, it, all, it could also be lonely because some of the most, you know, notable service organizations that we know around the world, even, where a lot of times were created by white folk, right? Who were particularly wealthy. A lot of the most notable nonprofits we know of were, were founded by wealthy people who did not look like me. And so there are particular resources that other nonprofit founders have had that are not that are, that are not of color to build institutions in a way that you know other folk, right? Uh, Black, Latina, Latinx, et cetera, our path is different to really creating the infrastructure for sustainability and longevity. And so sometimes that can be a little lonely to experience that. So I've had to kind of create a group of founder friends where we can just sit down and just just shoot, you know, just shoot the 
You know what I'm saying? Like just talk, talk our ish, you know, and veg out and over whatever, over happy hour or you can uh, you, you, you can swear if you want. I would observe though, as someone many, many degrees removed from what you're doing, but very inter- interested in why you do what you do. There are founders all over the world that would want to connect with what you're doing. And it's more about how do you grow your own environment of founders to find ideas to connect with um, resources that you might not otherwise have and I think the difficulty and and look I haven't done what you've done so again I'm only from an observer perspective is a good idea is a good idea and community focus always draws draws out high wealth individuals that want to contribute to making a difference and depending on your, your political thinking on this And, you know, some people have told me I would never accept money from tobacco. I might never accept money from the gambling lobby. I can understand why that is. For me, uh, being pragmatic, if if wherever your source of funding comes from, if you're, you're potentially not going to run a moral lens over what they do to earn their money and you're using that funding to help communities that are in dire need, I think that funding is out there everywhere. And it depends on what your checklist is of what, what is acceptable fundraising and what isn't. But the networks of people like yourself are not just local to the US, they're probably global. And given that you've given that you said you've you've only been really three more well, three and a bit years and you're already experienced exponential growth, that should tell you that the need is so big that yeah. selling the idea to someone with resource resources that could help you would be a, a pretty much a, a no brainer. But depends on where you're at in your journey of growing the foundation and where you think it needs to go. And that, again, only outside of perspective looking in. So that, that's amazingly interesting where this could go. And, and the fact that you've reached out to other other founders, mm-hmm. people that are in that startup space, yeah, you're, you're going to get a whole set of new ideas that you can test for yourself. And you may not necessarily Absolutely. agree with what they're doing, but that's kind of the point that I, I figured yeah. you don't learn as a leader if you don't get challenged. And hopefully your ego is not too big that you can't take a critique of what you're doing from your fellow founders, because I'm sure they will throw things at you going, oh, why did you do it this way? Why didn't you think about yeah. this? Mm-hmm. Oh, shit, I can't think of everything. And that's, I guess, that's the beauty of being collaborative but it also suggests that as a leader and this is what i'm I'm hearing and seeing a lot more in the people that i'm speaking to is if you're not a self-reflective practitioner in that leadership space and you're not prepared to take feedback on it makes your growth that much more difficult but the, the, the to stop the difficulty there i think it's can you put your ego to one side and let people give you constructive I'm talking constructive feedback, not destructive. So someone comes at you and says, you're no good and this is crap and I would have done it this way. Those kind of people you don't want in your circle because they're only going to make you have a double think about what it is that you're doing and that's not necessarily healthy and life's too short to be worried about what some idiot doesn't think is right about what you're doing. You know, everyone's got an everyone's got an opinion but doesn't necessarily make those opinions. Lisa, let me ask you something and this is about measuring success now you, you said you work in a in a in a in a difficult area and by difficult i mean you've got to get in and help people that really need some help what does measuring success look like to you as a leader in in the context in the world that you work i'll say this we we look at as an organization we have a mission we, we our mission is to build safe healthy and whole communities by increasing access to education health and wellness and the arts in underserved areas that's the mission as an organization we also have goals and, pro- and, and values, uh, both programmatic values. Every program we have has programmatic values and we have organizational values. And we use those to create lo- a logic model, theories of change to see kind of what our short outcomes, short-term outcomes are versus our long-term outcomes, our inputs, our outputs, et cetera. So we do have a way in which we evaluate through, you know, uh, through this kind of logic model, theory of change uh, process that we do to see how we're doing in light of our mission and our values. I would say though, from a, just from kind of an intrinsic, my own kind of way of seeing the organization, how the organization is progressing in terms of perform, uh, measuring success. So I used to think that the more locations we're in, the more successful we are. That's what I used to think. That changed in about three months because we started to grow in the midst of the pandemic, right? So we were growing very quietly because everybody was at home, right? So like when the institutions knew who we were 
in the communities that we were in. But again, it was it was very like it was drop offs and this, and it was it was very kind of it wasn't as it wasn't normal. And I realized that it's not it's not just about expansion, but how do we deepen our work? So I said that all the time to my staff, right? So basically, because if we're everywhere but we suck, then like what does it really mean, right? So, so again, every service that we have has goals. So I'll, I'll give you our education program for me. For example, we're in several schools across the district of Columbia in Maryland, Maryland um, in, in the U S. And so one of the benchmarks is grade increases. So we deal with students who you really usually have like an F or a D a very low mark in their, in their math and English classes. So our mentors and tutors go into the school, pull those students out to work with them one-on-one and in small group and real intensive, what we call high impact tutoring session. We have a two to three letter grade increase goal that if they start in the F, we want them no more than, a, no less than a C, but we try to get them to at least a B, a B average. So from a quantitative standpoint, like that's, that's a goal of ours, right? Like how are we getting them out of, right? failing to to achievement but again like what are the ways in which we do that okay it's not just about going in there and like all right get this work done like you know are you building relationship with the student how, how do we match our tutor and our students together thinking about that you know so we, we do matching we survey our students right so it don't matter if we're at like 10 schools if the students are like boo they suck then it doesn't matter <laughs> You know, it doesn't matter because then that means that, yeah, we're there, but we're not going deep with them. We want to do transformational work. We have to be intentional about the ways in which we're doing that work. And so those are the kinds of measures we look at when we when we work with our community members. So we do a lot of surveying, right? Like, has your life changed in, in your relationship with Raising a Village? Has Raising a Village changed your life for better or worse? That's a question we ask. And if they say yes, okay, then we know like we're doing the work there. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be pretty scared if somebody started yelling at boo, you suck. <laughs> oh my God, right? Yeah, you, kids you, will you, do that. <laughs> yeah, kids are honest in that way, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting that you do survey the communities because one thing that I find in the leader development space, and I guess this might apply outside of it, oh, I'm not surprised if it doesn't, is how do you measure the efficacy of what your intervention is if you don't ask some questions after the fact? And I'm, I'm sure you guys have got enough data to know what your baseline is of the people that you're working with. Interventions are interventions for a reason, but you, you're you not going to get best bang for buck, uh, as crass as that term is, if you don't assess whether or not what you did had an effect. And that mm-hmm. that's, as, that's as much a learning tool as anything else, because if something's not working, don't do that anymore or assess why it's not working and try something different. And um, I guess that's easy to do as you're a smaller scale startup or organization as you get bigger. And this is a, obviously a good problem to have. If you're experiencing exponential growth, then managing what that growth looks like for you and the people that you're working with is going to be exceptionally important. And um, if you look at the entrepreneur leadership, uh, entrepreneur slash leadership literature, there'll be a lot to be said around managing your growth. So it's fantastic to have a growth mindset, always look at the glass half full, but sometimes that growth to almost like beyond your controls um, issue. So yeah, that, that was um, interesting. Now, look, let me bring all of that together to ask you a, a question around leader capabilities. Now, you've given some hints on what you think, what I think they might be, but again, this is about you. So looking at your own leader pathway, what do you believe are key leader cap- capabilities uh, from your experiences? I believe in what I call multi-directional leadership. And you mentioned it earlier about having this ability to kind of, in essence, I'm paraphrasing, like humble ourselves and be self-reflective. Like that's a key part of leadership. And I've noticed in my journey so far that I've had to lead in, in different directions. There are sometimes I've been called to lead from the front. It's me and I'm leading everybody down the road, right? But then there are times where I've had to lead from the side. This might be with my staff, right? Work, working alongside them, not necessarily telling them what to do in a very explicit way, but helping and workshopping some things out with them. And I do that collaboratively I do that with partners as well and community members. So I'm leading from the side. I'm walking alongside them. And there may be times where I'm from the back where I've set the precedent. I've set the charge. 
but now I give everybody the opportunity to actually implement that charge, right? But I'm still in the back, I'm seeing everything, and I'm able to step in when need be. And I think as a leader, you have to have the ability to lead in multiple directions. You have to humble yourself to do that as a leader, to know when it's time to do when, where, how, right? And, and, and so basically what I'm saying is that being a leader takes having this ability to be contextually nimble, right? I say that all the time to my staff, especially in the context in which we live in now. There's a pandemic one day, flood the next, monkeypox the next, political upheaval next, protests. Of, there's so much happening. Oh, and then something happened with the celebrity on Instagram. Everybody's going crazy, right? Insta or TikTok, right? So much going on. So much context, so many contexts within the larger, within the, within the context of the world. And so I think as a leader, you have to be able to be contextually nimble, even in the, even in the lives of your, of your team. What COVID exposed for me as a leader, I was dealing with life. So, you know, in America, there was a whole, they called the racial reckoning because there was a lot of police brutality happening. A lot of, of black and brown folks being killed by the hands of the police. I'm a leader of a, of a nonprofit. I'm in these vulnerable communities, but also I am dealing with what I'm seeing in the news. That has an effect on me, right? I'm, I'm human, right? I'm human. And so what I had to learn was that if I have work, life, news, COVID, family, guess who also has that? My staff, right? And so being contextually nimble also has this ability to understand the world around you and, the, and, and how your folks community members, employees, whatever, that how they are also dealing with those multiple contexts. And again, how can you be nimble, nimble enough to still be able to get the job done, complete the mission, but understand where your people are? Um, so that, I think those, that's really the component of being a leader. Is- Amazingly consistent with the responses that I'm getting from other people that are talking to me about their journeys of, I think, the, the idea of embracing change and understanding that uh, people are resistant to change and that it, it's it's been made exceptionally clear by things like the pandemic that you either change or, or you're not going to go anywhere and, and things are going to get worse for you. But by the same token, I think you've raised something that, that's quite interesting is that I think the best leaders through the pandemic realize that we're all in the, in the same situation. This isn't just an issue facing employees. This is everyone. This is a difficult time for everyone to, to deal with the issues that have come up from the pandemic. And then you've got your social issues that impact. And in the US, they'll be different to Australia. Australia has its unique issues. You guys have got yeah. some unique yeah. issues. And then there's some issues that are transnational in nature that everyone has and sort of everything in between. So yeah, I, I get it. I, I get that um, being strategically agile, nimble as a terminology that you used and that understanding, and, and I'm, I'm coming to more of a real, realization on this personally, that I think this idea that leadership is necessarily complex and it's it's a it's a difficult art form is not a stunningly amazing finding but it is the reality that it, it's difficult to be a leader it's an art form and the reason people work on it through a, a lifetime or a career is you never get it right all the time but it's the process oh. of learning yeah it's a, it's a learning journey so Lisa, let me ask you this the nature versus nurture question uh from your experience are leaders born or are they made Oh, you know, I struggle with this so much. I'm, I'm going, oh, I'm going to cheat this. I, I'm, but, but it's true. I think it takes a little bit of both. And I'll say, I'll, I'll use my own, my, like my own self as an example. I, I think that there are natural capabilities in me of leadership. However, there are some key things that I needed to get better at in order to be a better leader. Like I'm very, I'm a charismatic person. I like to talk. I like to communicate. I told you I want to be on TV, right? Like I, I, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm all there. Yada, yada, yada. But an administrator, like paying attention to detail, terrible. Like <laughs> terrible. Like I, was, well, say, I wasn't terrible because clearly I made, like I did some really amazing things in my life, but it was clearly an area of growth. It was a growing edge. And that had to be nurtured because leadership is not just about the being the charismatic. Because a lot of people think about like, we think about your great leaders, think about the, the speaker, the person that can rally the troops and inspire. That's a part of it. But it takes a lot of the little things that people don't see in order to actually 
make the charisma or the vision happen. And so some of that I think needs to be nurtured. If you know, yes, you need to delegate to other people. I agree. But I do think that leaders should, whatever areas that they aren't, they might have some issue or grow, they might be their growing edges. They need to nurture that. And so there have been some key things in my life that I've had to nurture. And even with my staff that I'm, I'm actually growing a leadership team right now. And so some of them have said to me, like, actually a lot of them have said to me when I hired them, I'm not a leader, never led. And I'm like, no, but I can see it, right? I can see it, but they might, so that, but some of them have had to get better at their public speaking skills. Some of them had to get better at, you know, um, some of their, uh, the ways in which they maybe communicate in the various ways. They're like, you know, we all have our growing edges. And so I think it's a little bit of both. And I, let me ask the last thing I'll say. I always say that leadership, leaders build legacy. And I think good leaders train up good leaders. I do think it's both, you know, I, like it's our job to train other people to do what we do and to not make a monument of ourselves. I, I definitely don't. If I said to you, and I don't, I don't think I would be out of school by saying this, that you're probably a classically extroverted human being, yes? Yes. Yeah, okay. And so let me follow this up. Did you find it difficult to deal with the world around you through COVID because you couldn't have the same social connections you could have had before? Was that Did COVID make that difficult for you or not? Yes, it did. It did because founders and CEOs are typically out in the community. They're out. They're out. They're out talking to people. And I enjoy that. Uh, that's the best part of my job. It's the other stuff. I'm like, Ooh. but that part I really enjoy. So having to find ways to have that come across on screen was much more difficult. And also a lot of times it made me more, a lot of more depleted because I feel like I had to exert even more energy to make my point. And also I think it even now as the world is kind of opening back up again, I'm noticing how like now I'm getting invited out a lot more and I'm noticing just how much I missed that. The ability to be the face is something I, I missed and I couldn't do because of where we were, and, but how valuable it is to do that, that work. So yeah, it was difficult. I am the reverse. I'm classically introverted and it's taken me a career to to come out of my shell in a work and in podcast content. So you can't be a classic introvert and host a podcast and have a discussion with someone if you don't like to be around people or like to talk to people, I guess. And I'm not saying that's the only quality of an of a classically introverted person, but yeah, I wasn't naturally the person out front. I wasn't naturally a good public speaker, but I had my own goals in life professionally that I needed to achieve and as I sort of climb that ladder you start to realize if you if you're not a people person if you can't hold a conversation if you can't listen more than you speak if you don't understand about being humble in your approach to things and understanding that people are in work for lots of different reasons not the same reasons as you and if you can bring that into the mix it, it makes you I, I think a better employee let alone better human being in the workspace and for me COVID was was I was working from home anyway for the last seven years. It was just more of the same for me, but yeah. I could see it talking to people and more of the Zoom conversations that you had to have and more of the groups uh, meetings that had to happen via available technology that you could see in the pe people that you know in your own circles. I won't ask you to name them because I won't, but you could see the extroverts mm -hmm. just wanting to, I just want to get out. I don't want to be in front of a screen. And yeah, I, I think covid really magnified those differences in people. But I think the challenge for leaders into the future in your space, as well as every other space of, of field of work is you're going to have to get used to hybrid ways of dealing with people, like not yeah. just face to face, but using the tech, using the phone more, email platforms, group work platforms. These things are going to not fundamentally, I don't, I don't think it's gone that far, but there will be a change in how people work and expectations of the people that you take on will be different as yeah. well, given what. Oh, yeah. All right. So before we go, let me uh, two things I want to get to one. I want you to plug what you do in the foundation, but that's for the end of the podcast. But I have one more area I'd like to get to. Get to. And look, 
you're starting off your career. So I typically ask this for people that are at my stage of a career at the end of it, because, hey, look back and what would you do different if you had a crystal ball to go back and look at what you might do different. But looking at your career leadership pathway to this point, if you had to go back to a, a younger version of yourself, what would you say to yourself about being a more effective leader? I would go back to when I was in my 20s in college, and I would tell her that the 20-something-year-old Jaleesa to pay attention. As leaders, we have, there's so much going on, and I have to slow myself down to this day sometimes to just pay attention to what's happening organizationally, but also out in the world because that affects our work, right? And and there's and as leaders are getting pulled in so many directions, everybody's asking you for everything. Everybody needs to hear from you. Yada 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 yada. So so how does so I'm even teaching myself, reteaching myself. There are times where I have to slow down and pay attention, even to the mundane tasks, to not do anything just to get it out of the way, to be a taskmaster, but to make sure that you're doing things intentionally. Just because that matters and how the quality of your work, but also it keeps you present for where you are. Because I was so busy just trying to make it, you know, 20-somethings, we're just trying to make it. You're just trying to get to the next thing that you forget to enjoy the journey of where you are. And I almost missed that. And so even now with this exponential growth, I'm in, I'm in, I was actually like, I'm cool at three locations. Now I'm at 10. I'm like, that's, that's growing pain. You know what I'm talking about? Growth, but not the growing pains of growth. And so I'm even in this space because I do want to be national is to say, Hey, you know what? I'm cool where I am. You know, we'll see. Right. And so just enjoying the journey is what I would say. Before we go, could you give us a, a bit of an overview of what you do at the Raising a Village Foundation, please? Yes. So I am the founder and CEO of Raising a Village Foundation. It basically means that I manage the operational strategic initiatives of the organization um, on the executive level. So I do the budgeting. I do the strategic planning. I think of, I do the partnership acquisitions of who we're going to partner with out in the community. I also recruit the leadership team, the leadership staff, who also then recruit the rest of our programmatic. Um, and I do a lot of the fundraising is me. That is me. That's what EDs do. That's what executive directors do is how can we continue to create diverse revenue streams so the organization can not only sustain itself, but to continue to do the work that we have been called to do. That is what I do at RAV and it is the best. Excellent. So I'll put a link to the foundation and of course to your LinkedIn profile. So Julissa Hall, thank you for your time, mate. Thank you so much, Eric. This was a pleasure. I hope that we can do this again. This was awesome. Thank you for the offer. Yes, I, I will I will remember that because um the, this topic area is quite nuanced and I think you, we can have conversations in lots of directions around what leadership means to people. And, you know, my goal in, in all this is to have people listen to you and to my other guests and if they can draw some wisdom from what you're talking about, this is why I do what I do to get um, uh, education out there around this thing called leadership. So for those listening, this has been the Talking Leadership podcast series. Thank you for joining me again. Please stay safe and we'll catch everyone on the next podcast.